Damon Edwards from Run Deck coming on now. So uh, please take a seat and uh, enjoy the presentation. Damon, it's all yours. Yeah, hi, how you doing? Um, squeeze in, come on in. So uh, after those demos, they were showing some pretty uh, exciting things. I'm just going to be, I think, a big fat bummer after, after, uh, after that. Because my talk's all about you know, what happens after you build the cool thing, right? How do we get that out into the world? And uh, how do we deal with what goes wrong? Um, after it's out in, into, the, into the world, where so much of our time in operations is spent on just that. You know, what do we do post-production? How do we handle incidents? And all the chaos and problems that we seem to find, uh, find from that. So I'm Damon Edwards. Um, I think why I'm up here, I uh, have an interesting uh, career um, from uh, DTO Solutions, which I used to run, which was a DevOps and uh, operations improvement consultancy, um, and now I'm at Rundeck, I'm the co-founders of that. We make um, tools for SREs and systems administrators to tie together their existing tools and scripts and also uh, provide self-service access to other people in their organization and really start to change how they, uh, how they work. And then I've been heavily involved in the DevOps movement from the early days. Uh, and um, I do a podcast called DevOps Cafe. I don't know if anybody's... Oh, all right. Well, so you're the person. OK, I got it. <laughs> wonder who that one download was. Um, and uh, also on uh, Gene uh, Kim's uh, IT Revolutions DevOps Enterprise Summit. So I get to see a lot of companies, inside and out, uh, you know, large enterprises, banks, financial services, large startups. So I get to really, I a lucky guy and got to see the inside of what makes these organizations tick. And that's a lot of what I'm going to talk about um, today. So let's start with a story. I'm going to go on a tale of, uh, of, uh, of woe here, I guess you can call it. Um, this is a true story, and it's uh, based on um, a large company. All these events happened, um, although the names have been uh, changed uh, to uh, protect the not so not so innocent. And this company, you know, is is uh, quite was quite proud of their transformation work, right? Uh, they like to give talks on it. They, you know, they had a digital uh, transformation initiative. They had agile. They had DevOps. They had SRE on the technology side. They had cloud. They had Docker. They had Kubernetes. They had microservices. It was a uh, it was, a, it was a bonanza of, uh, of change. Um, but you know, kind of the not so secret, uh, or I guess the secret, is what happened after deployment? That start didn't look so good, right? So let's go through uh, what a, a, an actual incident uh, looked like. So um, it's 9.30 in the morning, right? And in the NOC, they start seeing some, some, uh, some alerts going off. And they're like, hey, wasn't there some errors like this earlier in the week? Other people are like, yeah, but this looks a little different, not quite sure. Seems to be getting worse. We should keep an eye on it. Uh, around 10 AM, you know, phone rings. Uh, I guess the business manager is running while he's on the phone, uh, saying, hey, there's a problem. Customers are effective. What are we going to do about this, right? So Bob from the knock springs into action, um, and he opens a, opens a ticket and says, hey, we don't know what it is, but um, he copies the business manager, and then all the different app-specific SREs saying something's going on, got all these, all these lights. What is it, right? So you guys, you guys know what happens next. Someone starts the bridge call. Um, you know, they're all the uh, app-specific SREs spring into action and start trying. We'll do this, do that. Uh, there are certain systems they don't have access to. Uh, they have production data in them, so they have to get somebody from the legacy systems administration team with production access to come and help them out with that. Uh, of course, uh, the, some business managers found the bridge call, and they call in and start going, is it there, is it there, is it there yet? And uh, you know, someone, they finally come to the conclusion, hey, this is a problem with the food service, right? There's something wrong with this, this food service. And uh, you know, can you fix it? And the, uh, the food SRE is like, no, this is a new version of the application I haven't seen before. I'm not really sure what's, what's, uh, what's going on here. So Bob uh, opens up a ticket, right? Or uh, updates a ticket to say, hey, you know, we need the food lead developer in on this, uh, on this one, right? And it delays. And that food lead developer is uh, Karen, right? And Karen's in the, the end, towards the end of her sprint. She's doing great. Uh, she loves this new agile scrum you know, uh, um, uh, uh, way of, uh, of working. And you know, her email's dinging, ding, ding. She's just ignoring it. She's got her headphones on. She's locked in. Everything's uh, great until finally, you know, knock, knock, knock. Uh, manager knocks on the door and says, hey, Karen, have you seen this, uh, this ticket uh, about the food service? She goes, oh, OK, well, I'll. I'll uh, I'll take a look. Um, starts digging through things and says, hey, you know, I'm going to need more 
logs here. I, I, I'm not really sure what exactly is happening. I don't see it in Splunk. I don't see it in over, over in our other log stash over, over here. It's all uh, spread around. So she raised this ticket um, that, hey, I need someone from the systems administration team to help me out with these uh, production logs. Um, you know, she then hops into the chat, knows where to find them, and says, hey, I need help, help with this. Finally, somebody, his name's Lee, comes to, comes to help. And uh, Karen says, hey, I need these logs. Now, I'm sure, you know, he got, she got the first logs, she got the logs right on the first time, right? No, of course not, right? So they go around and around, and they're going for, uh, finally she sees the one that she needs. It's like, yep, that's, that's the ones I need. Let me look at it. And uh, if you noticed, um, kind of down on the bottom here, uh, this, this piece here, this is something that's kind of the, one of the evils of, of using tickets for everything. We call it the context wagon, right? And it's like each person that gets notified um, by this ticket. And as the ticket grows, the ticket gets worked on longer, uh, more and more people get added to this, to this context wagon, right? Until everybody has to, have, has to pile, pile on in. And you, know, you may be able to ignore it, um, but at the same time, you know, it, it occupies a little bit of your brain, right? So watch the, keep an eye on the context wagon as we go here. It keeps growing and, and growing. So Karen looks at these logs and says, hey, you know, uh, something's wrong, right? Uh, something's wrong with these containers. Uh, they were, um, you know, who restarted these? Why they restart them? Not really sure. Whatever happened, they didn't use the correct environment variables, right? So uh, this entire service pool needs to be restarted, all kinds of errors. I'm not sure what's, what's, uh, what's happening. So Bob says, okay. He's running the incident here. He says, all right, well, I'm going to add the, the middleware team. So the middleware team, please do this uh, restart of this service pool with the correct environment variables. Um, next thing you know, Bob's phone rings, you know, and it's uh, Melissa, the middleware manager. She's like, are you crazy? It's the middle of the day. We can't do that. Uh, you know, it's potential customer impact. You need business approval of the highest level. We've had too many problems with this. So now it's 2.30 in the afternoon since we started having this problem. And Bob updates the ticket for the SVP, uh, the line of business. Um, you know, it's the big boss. Uh, you know, she uh, is in meetings. She's busy all day long. You know, and, and says, hey, we need to do this. So Susan gets her uh, chief of staff, says, hey, is this going to be a problem? Can we do this, this restart? Chief of staff reaches out to, to, to the different uh, VPs. Um, you know, can we do this restart? And they all decide, hey, you know, it's a restart. How bad could it, how bad could it be? What could go wrong, right? So ding, restart uh, approved, right? Now it's 5 o'clock at night. Uh, the middleware team finally gets the ticket back, and they say, OK, well, let's Let's go ahead and do this uh, restart. Who best knows these services? Who can restart these, you know, who knows all the ins and outs? Oh, it's Ellen. Okay, well, let's get Ellen. Oh, we can't. We just put Ellen on a plane for uh, our European office to help with a big, a big launch, right? And so then uh, we say, well, who's the next person? Well, Scott. Scott's relatively new, but Scott knows these things. He could figure it out, right? So Scott uh, has to, you know, start digging through the, the, the SharePoint servers, right? We call it the, the dumpster diving, looking for documentation, trying to figure out, make sure he's got all the... Uh, the loose ends, and finally decide, okay, I think I've got this. Uh, it's just before 6 in the evening. It's been going on all day. I think I've got a good sense of what, how this, uh, what's going on here, and starts restarting the different, uh, relaunching the different services. And, um, but one doesn't launch, right? Uh, it's the bar service. It says, waiting for Acme service, waiting for Acme service. After 10 minutes, it says, you know, Acme startup failed, right? And now, now Scott's sweating, right? It's like, come on, don't, no, no. <laughs> like, don't let this, this be happening to me. Uh, why isn't this starting? What's, you know, what's going on? You know, he's starting to sweat. Uh, all the attention is on me. I can feel that Susan's out there somewhere thinking uh, about the SVP, uh, what's, uh, what's going on here. So, you know, Scott furiously launches off the next ticket, right? Uh, update says, hey, you know, bar app uh, startup timed out. The error says I can't connect to the Acme service. Um, but I went to the Acme environment, and I can see the application is running. Uh, is this error message correct? Why can't bar actually uh, connect? Raises the ticket um, and adds for the, uh, the, bar, uh, the bar SRE. And that's a legacy service, so it's a whole different, uh, whole different group. And uh, uh, finally, the bar SRE comes along and says, hey, this uh, DevOps program we did, you know, we want to ha have these environment preflight checks, right? So the app has a, a check in it that checks for all the services it may it may need, and that can't connect uh, to this Acme app, and that's what's causing the bar app startup to, to hang. So update the ticket again, uh, and they ask for the lead developer on bar. They also ask for the network team, see if someone can fix it. The bar team says, oh yeah, great, I can, you know, I can comment out that, that, um, uh, that, that check. Um, only problem is uh, this new CD pipeline we got, it only goes to the QA environment. 
So I can't actually get it into production. I'm going to have to raise another ticket with the change team to come and review the package. And OK, stop, stop, no problem. We'll, uh, <laughs> we'll try the network route, right? Uh, but at the same time, um, you know, the business managers are calling the, the uh, Melissa, the middleware manager, saying, what's wrong with your, you know, your, uh, your services? And she just goes, it's the network, right? It's not, it's not me, you know, great sense of uh, finger pointing. So the business managers, what do they do? They get all the phone numbers for the VPs of the network team, and they're calling them, saying, what's, what the heck's going on here with your, with your network? Why is it falling apart? And they say, oh, it's OK. It's OK. We're on it. We got all our best people on it. Uh, the problem is they're thinking about a different incident, right? That all the network SREs are, uh, there was some larger uh, 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 network outage that they were working on uh, somewhere in their network. So the network team is, is thinking, I've got to ignore everything else. I've got to stay on this particular outage when they don't realize all the business pressure is coming from a different, a different problem. Finally, Scott remembers that you know, he has beers with uh, Carlos, the director on the network team, and says, OK, hey, uh, you know, um, Carlos, can we fix this, right? Can we get some, can we get some escalation here? So Carlos uh, figures out what's going on and uh, finally gets a, a network SRE to come and, and, uh, and help out. And he says, yep, uh, the firewall's blocking the traffic. Uh, you have to take it up with the firewall team, right? So they raise the ticket again, and uh, they page the, uh, the on-call, uh, Freddy, the, Freddy the firewall. And Freddy, uh, Freddy comes along and says, hey, look, this can't be the firewall, right? You know, this just happened today. We haven't changed anything since last Thursday. Um, and uh, you know, Scott says, no, it's the, it's, the, it's the firewall. Please look into it. So digs into it, and it uh, turns out, yep, there was a firewall rule change last Thursday uh, that would stop Barr from uh, uh, talking to, uh, to Acme. And Scott's like, OK, well, can you change it back? And Freddie's like, sure, we make changes on Thursday. You know, and then, whoa, whoa, no, we got to, you know, this is a customer outage. We have to actually do something about this today. So uh, Chief of Staff, luckily, he found his way onto that bridge call and was like, hey, we've got to figure this out. You know, everyone's, uh, everyone's livid. So <laughs> we're going on here. It's 9 o'clock at night. You know, our contacts wagon is, uh, is growing. Everybody's, everybody's looking at this. And uh, Freddie escalates to the security team saying, hey, NetSec, we need this emergency change, right? Um, and so, you know, Nicole, the, uh, the on-call for the NetSec team, gets it and says, OK, great. You know, if I can just get three of five cab members to, uh, to approve this change in our next cab meeting, then we'll make, whoa, hey, you know, we've got we've to stop this customer outage. And then finally, somebody says the magic word. Uh, I'll call the SVP Susan. And then, ding, magically, uh, emergency change uh, is, uh, is approved. So it's 9.30 at night, um, working together, the, the firewall group, the, um, uh, the network group, and the uh, middleware group. They do the firewall change, open up the ports, do the restart, and uh, Scott goes, hey, I, I, think, I think we're good here. And they're like, you're good? Why, you know, why do you think you're, what, don't we know? And it's like, no, well, you know, we've had enough problems in the, um, in the past that they won't let us actually uh, check the APIs to make sure they're working. They want somebody from the customer engagement team to actually verify, and separation of duties, something, something, they have to be the ones that tell us whether or not these APIs are working. Well, who does that? Her name's Varsha. Uh, she doesn't expect to be working at, uh, at night, but she gets called. Um, it's 1030 at night. She's at her birthday, par her birthday party. She has to leave early to come home to, uh, uh, to do this. Finally, does all the tests. They say, yes, this is, uh, this is good. Um, and they updated the uh, ticket to say everything's all right. Uh, Scott Chain closed out the ticket, say services are all right. The knock says, hey, lights are green. I guess this is fixed, you know, and we're, our, problem is, uh, our problem is solved. And think about all the people now who have been pulled along in that uh, context wagon with this, right? Just for a simple, simple, simple couple of restarts. And then, of course, the next day, um, you know, Susan, the SVP, gathers everyone together and is like, why are we so bad at change? You know, why does this keep happening? Whose fault is this? What approvals and extra process can we put into place so this never happens again, right? Uh, I'm sure, how many people have been in that kind of meeting before? Yeah, 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 okay. It's life, uh, it's life, right? So this is a typical tale of woe. This is again, this, all this actually actually happened. And then of course, this happens enough that uh, at some point in the future, um, you know, someone raises their hand in an executive team meeting and is like, hey, look, uh, we've invested in cloud. We've invested in agile. We've done DevOps. We've done containers. Now there's some things I don't even understand, like serverless, right? Why does everything still take so long and cost so much, right? And somebody finally admits, you know, all this transformation, we've kind of forgotten about operations. We haven't fundamentally changed how we operate as a, uh, as a company, right? So uh, 
now kind of, that's the end of the tale. Now we'll go back to kind of the, uh, <laughs> the luxury part of the, uh, of the talk. Um, but if you think about, you know, how the conventional wisdom on improving operations, right? Uh, it's a few things. Number one, we need better tools, right? It's always, you know, we need, we need more tools, we need better tools. Uh, then we need another tool after that. Um, yet we never seem to get where we want to uh, go by adding new tools. And I'm a tools vendor too, so I can, <laughs> I can say that with some uh, impunity. Um, we need more people, right? That's the other one. Oh, we don't have enough people for this. Well, we're not going to get more people, right? Um, you know, we need to scale without literally scaling the number of people in our, in our, uh, in our organization. And besides, every time you've added more people to the operations realm, it just seems to, their, 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 their capacity evaporates along with everybody else's, right? So no matter how many bodies we add, we still don't have enough time. We still don't get enough things done. Uh, this is one of my favorite. We need more discipline, right? We need more attention to detail. I mean, this is like telling developers, you know, try harder not to write bugs, right? It just doesn't, <laughs> it's just not going to happen when you're working in a complex system. And uh, we'll talk more about this one later, but the, uh, you know, we need more change reviews and approvals, right? Uh, I mean, if we haven't approved ourselves uh, into a downward spiral of death yet, uh, this definitely, this definitely, uh, definitely will. So I'm going to say, you know, throw out the conventional wisdom and, uh, what I want to see us do is replace it with really understanding what causes these problems in the first place. Why is it so difficult to, um, you know, uh, uh, to have the high velocity, um, you know, low cost, high quality operations that we, that we want? And there's two fundamental things here that prevent us from, from doing that. Uh, the first one is silos. Don't worry, I'll go into all this in detail. First one is silos, and the second is, you know, ticket-driven request queues, right? You know, tickets, the things that, that are the lifeblood of, uh, of operations. So let's start with silos. You know, silos get kind of this cursory overview, like silos are bad, right? Now on to my next, you know, slide, right? Uh, we don't really talk about what silos are. Some people think, well, silos are teams. And silos aren't really teams. Silos are more about a way of working, right? So if you imagine, you know, how people want to work, right? They work with, you know, they have their backlog or their priorities. They have the information they need to do their job. They have the tools they need to do their job. And they're locked into their context doing things how, you know, uh, how they want to work. And, you know, this is kind of natural human uh, nature is to get people together, do the same thing, and they'll focus on these common set of, uh, you know, priorities, information, you know, backlog, tooling, and get things done. Highly effective. Think about a five-person startup in a room. It's all great. We're all locked into that same, that same thing. But the reality is in, in the enterprise, nothing lives in isolation, right? You always need something from, from somebody else. And this is where the silos really start to, uh, start to kick in, right? So you have one person or group of people working in one context. They need, somebody from some, they need something from somebody else who's working in a different context. And that's where these, uh, these problems start to, start to happen. And the reason is because of the disconnects and the mismatches that happen between those, uh, those two groups that are working in their own, in their own, their own silos, right? Uh, there's context mismatches, right? I can have the exact same information, and I see it some way. Um, and, you know, Bob has the exact same information. He's going to see it a different way because he's working in a different context, right? All the work we do is, um, is contextual, right? They, they have disconnected processes. They each want to optimize for their own work, disconnected tooling, disconnected um, uh, capacity as well, right? So, you know, I have, I'm a development team. I have a ton of people on my team. Uh, I'm a firewall team. I have a very few amount of people on my team, right? It's a mismatch in capacity, mismatch in speed. Uh, that's a major, major issue as well. And so how do we cover uh, for our silos and all of these disconnects, right? Well, we drop this thing in the middle, call a ticket queue, right? This is, this is our, 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 our solution. Is we say, okay, well, we'll just open a ticket. It goes into a queue for that other, that other team. They will get that ticket. They'll do it perfectly the first time and, and on time, and they'll send it back to you, right? The reality is we all know how this goes, right? We get these disconnects between these teams. We open a ticket. Uh, the ticket gets closed because of the wrong information. We open the ticket again with the right information, and uh, the person who gets it does something. We get it back. We realize we didn't really understand what we we're asking for. We have the wrong thing. We go around, around and around and around. The common kind of chain of, uh, of tickets, all the things you saw during that, that story of these kind of chains of tickets going between different people working in different silos. And you know, the reality is there's actually a lot of science behind this. Uh, there's a great book called um, The uh, Principles of Product Development Flow uh, by a guy named Don Reinertsen. Um, it's really all about the, the physics and the science behind uh, cues and flow and you know, how um, work moves through complex systems. And the reality is we know that cues are, 
are economically expensive, right? Queues uh, create longer cycle times, right? It takes longer uh, for things to get, to get done when you keep placing them in queues. There's increased risk because there's a longer f feedback loops. Um, we know from, you know, that that, that increases the risk. Something will go wrong. There'll be a, there'll be a, um, a miscommunication. There's more variability, right? Because people are kind of doing a lot of one-offs. Uh, there's more overhead. All the, all, of, all the expense it takes to manage those queues, all the project management, all the escalations, all of the, you know, the working the system, so to speak. Um, all those things add up to lower quality and also lower motivation. I mean, it's, it's, it's been proven that people have to wait longer to see the fruits of their work or feel more, less connected to their work, right? I, if it takes me a week to see uh, what I did, uh, see the result come through, people are less motivated and less connected to what they, what they do. So queues are intrinsically expensive things, yet what do we do, right? This is, this is, this is the, uh, you know, how we, we decide we're going to, uh, to manage our, our lives and, and operations. And you know, these, these ticket-driven request queues actually make things even worse, right? There's a couple other things. So snowflakes, right? Uh, this is something that you know, people talk a lot about kind of in the DevOps and Agile. The idea that uh, you know, a snowflake means it might be technically correct, right? Like a perfect snowflake. But the reality is you'll never be able to do that same thing twice, right? So a slightly a manual change um, is often a snowflake, right? Because you'll never be able to make it the same way the same way twice. And when you have these request queues, you have a lot of experts on either side. Uh, they end up making a lot of snowflakes. And snowflakes are bad because they cause unexpected conditions, right? You know, somebody restarted those containers in that example, and somebody messed up the flags for the, the environment variables. We now have a snowflake. Things are, things are different, right? Or if we're trying to automate a large fleet of, uh, of servers, little manual changes along the way is going to undermine that automation. The only thing worse than, you know, automation that doesn't work is automation that's just a little bit wrong, right? Uh, it causes a lot more a lot more damage. So this way of working through queues is naturally, you know, gives rise to these snowflakes. Also, on either side of the queue, uh, we end up with uh, what we call siloed labor pools, right? Uh, you take groups of experts, you put them in that silo, you, uh, you, uh, you know, tell them to optimize for, their, for the thing that they do, they end up becoming basically a, 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 a pool of specialist labor, right? They get a ticket, it says, oh, I'm needed over here to go fix this problem. They go and fix it. They make a firewall rule change. They do some of the network. They do some security check. They you know, help with an incident. And then it's, oh, ding, I got another ticket. I'm going to go over here and, and help with them. Each time, they're kind of jumping into a new, a new context as often the, uh, the hero. Whatever they're doing is going to be a little bit off, a little bit different each time. And uh, effectively, you have snowflakes at each point and people start working more and more in these, these siloed uh, labor pools. And uh, the management insight, um, or the management focus becomes a lot, a lot different, right? So, um, you know, you, you kind of, the classic uh, VP of no in operations, you know, you know part of that is, is because of risk, but the other major reason for that is because they're managing these siloed labor pools and they have to protect the capacity of their team. That is the number one thing that they, that they need to do. There's always more people outside. There's always more requests outside. Um, I'm stuck in this field in the requests one at a time. I have to protect that, that capacity and say no a lot. Another kind of uh, um, unintended consequence of driving our lives through, through tickets. And then also, you know, tickets add up all these little delays, right? And all those little delays, those little cuts, add up to, to, to bigger delays, which is really is the increased cost of delay uh, of delivering, right? And this is some, a great way to speak to the business about this problem which is you know, the amount of time between when we could have realized revenue from doing something and the, and the time that we actually do uh, realize revenue for doing something, that is the cost of delay. There's real quantifiable um, uh, cost there. And uh, something needs to be considered. And this idea that everything's going to bounce through our organization um, using, using these ticket systems just adds to, that, to that, cost of, uh, that cost of delay, makes things a lot worse. So yet, despite all this, right, despite the, the, the mismatches, despite the, the obvious economic cost, despite all the problems we see in front of us, the snowflakes, the silo, labor pools, the cost of delay, right, this is still the common thought on how we're supposed to manage operations, right? Functional silos and uh, ticket-driven um, request queues. So now think about all the different examples, all the different silos uh, that were in that example, all different siloed ways of working. People were, were working, slightly disconnected from each other, bouncing things through, through ticket queues, working in different contexts, working, uh, you know, task switching between different, uh, between different activities. And we saw all those problems, right, in that, in, that, uh, in that example. So what can we do differently, 
right? Uh, you know, this is, uh, I think, the big question. I'm not pretending to have all the answers, but I think we need to kind of talk through these, uh, these problems and think about a new way or better way to, uh, to work. So the obvious answer, and this, I think, comes out of the, the DevOps sort of push towards operations, is let's get rid of, many of these, as many of these silos as possible, right? If we can get rid of the need for handoffs, for moving work from one, you know, from one silo to another, we won't have those handoff problems, we won't have those delays, and we can go on, on forward, right? So this is where the idea of kind of cross-functional teams comes into play, right? How can we put as many people as possible um, who can get uh, whatever we're doing from inception to delivery uh, from the beginning of the incident to the end, how can we put as many of those folks on the same team as possible across all the functional domains that we need to, uh, to get our jobs done, right? So we hear about this like in, in, in the Netflix or the Amazon model, kind of they're the, they're the sort of pure plays in this, in this department where they have the idea that you want everything on one team and they want to keep their team small. Uh, they have that two pizza team idea, right? Which is, uh, you know, that they shouldn't have a team larger than two extra large pizzas can... Uh, uh, can, can feed. Um, you know, that is a sort of a business mindset of moving towards this, this cross-functional team idea. But of course, we all know, you know, especially in the enterprise, we run out of teams pretty quickly when we do this, right? Uh, I've seen uh, folks kind of start this exercise, and after like an hour, or less than an hour, they're like, oh, we're out of people when we still have, you know, 95 <laughs> services left to, uh, to cover. So the reality is there's all these specialist capabilities that we can't um, put into these cross-functional teams. We can't give them their own data center. We can't give everybody their own network team. We can't give everybody their own, you know, security team. Um, you know, all these different kind of specialties that we can't, we can't do. So unfortunately, what happens is we're right back to the same problem, right? Where we got to use ticket queues to um, push the work through those, those, those uh, specialist groups. So we get a little bit better, but we're suffering right back from the same problems we had before. And then of course, what about the interaction between all these different teams, right? Uh, they each need you know, something from, from each other. Uh, we're right back into queues there as well. So it gets us a little bit down the road, but doesn't solve all of our, our problems. So this is where you know, the kind of operations as a service idea uh, comes in. That's sort of a name that the folks at Rundeck put on this idea, but we sort of see it happening throughout the industry. And the idea is uh, to, instead of have you know, these, these different operational capabilities. I'm kind of talking in the ops context now. But instead of having these, spe these, these specialist capabilities as siloed labor pools, turn them into service providers, um, encouraging them or, or teaching them to create operational services that can be pulled on demand from other people in the, in the organization. So the idea there being that all the things that the cross-functional team would have to go outside of their team for uh, get out of the idea of opening a ticket and have somebody else doing it for you. Instead, look for, uh, to create uh, automated, you know, pull-based services that they can use on demand, right? So think less like, you know, uh, old-fashioned Savvis uh, managed service provider, more like AWS, right? Where um, another team is building something for you to consume, but you're using an, a, through a pull-based interface, not a, uh, uh, you know, kind of a human-driven ticket request queue, right? So, you know, this also works. So I know, you know, part of, the, uh, part of the issue people have with this model is, well, we're not ready for this full cross-functional team idea, right? We still have a lot of legacy. We need to have our own separate uh, operations organization. Uh, there's a question of project-based funding, right? We're very much a project-based funding organization. Should we spin up lots of different things? We don't have kind of a long-running, uh, you know, product-based organization. And you know, this model works across the traditional development and operations divide. Put as much as you can into those uh, delivery teams, but uh, you know, maintain a separate operations organization. In fact, uh, the gentleman before from, from Google, th their model is more like this, right? They have delivery teams in a separate kind of operations organization. Now they embed their SREs on those teams as well. I mean, it's kind of a different, a different take on it, but there's still that, you can recognize that classic uh, dev and ops divide. And this idea of, of avoiding the tickets uh, to drive your work at all costs and doing things through operationalized platforms and, and uh, uh, you know, tooling delivered as, as a service is how, if you listen to him talk, it's how they make it work. It's how they have the, the handoffs so smoothly between the engineering teams, the app uh, operations teams, and the cluster engineering, te engineering teams. They aren't raising a ticket and someone's doing manual work, work, uh, work for you. So, you know, before people, I'm not completely against the idea of, uh, of tickets. Tickets do have their place. Um, you know, number one, you know, they're originally called trouble tickets for a reason, right? They were about raising issues, raising true exceptions, right? Where do things go wrong? 
Um, being in the, here in the history, Computer History Museum, I wish uh, uh, um, uh, someone can tell me how this actually <laughs> came about. It's hard to find a history of where the trouble ticket idea came from, but it makes sense, right? If I truly have an exception, where do I document that and raise that to somebody's attention? Uh, tickets are also good for routing for approvals. If you need to have, uh, need to have approvals, um, it's a better you know, system than email for that. Uh, you know, but tickets are not good as a general work management system, a way to tell everybody in your organization, this is how we're going to give you permission and route and run your day-to-day -day work. And it's a miserable way to work. I mean, if you remember that example we went through, like that's a pretty crappy way to go through your day-to-day. Uh, <laughs> -day. So uh, I actually hid something here. There is a third force, right? And that's low trust. Maybe I didn't uh, trust that I would, uh, <laughs> should talk about this. But this is something you see common in organizations is, um, you know, how and where um, decisions are made is an indication of the level of trust inside the organizations. Low trust organizations are very defensive, very, very political, whole lot of cover your ass. It's a tough, uh, it's much, you know, tougher, less uh, psychologically safe place to work. Higher trust organizations, um, you know, there's a lot of kind of academic Harvard Business Review research around this, are a lot more effective, a lot more efficient, um, and have a lot higher employee retention. So if you think about where decisions are made, it says a lot about the trust in an organization, right? Um, you know, before I get to that, you know, uh, are decisions made, you know, closest to, to the problem, or is it made by, you know, the highest paid person uh, in the room? You know, what's the, uh, what's, what's the model? And John Allspaugh, I don't know if you guys know who he is, uh, he used to run um, the technology organization at Etsy, and now he's actually a pretty well-known researcher in the field of you know, operations and human factors and understanding why problems happen. He does this thing where he says, you know, how many people think is that dangerous, right? Could be, right? Depends. Then he asks this one, he goes, well, is this dangerous? Right? This, this simple you know, check in, this, run, this diff here, I change the uh, lowercase k to an uppercase k, right? Yeah, it seems pretty safe. Unless it's a health check <laughs> for, a, for a load balancer, right? Then it makes all the difference in, in, the, uh, in, in the world, right? So, you know, his main point is all work is contextual, right? And everything we do is contextual. You need the full context to know whether it was safe, to know whether it was good, to know whether it was, it was, it was bad. But in these kind of organizations, who has the right context, right? Um, you know, kind of as you're closer to the incident or closest to, to what you want to, uh, uh, you know, what you're trying to do, they have all the on the street level knowledge of the incident. But then the further you get back away from them up the escalation chain, well, they, were, they had all the, the context on, on how that stuff was put together and got there. But you have this problem where, the, where you know, the context gets, gets, uh, gets, gets split. So, you know, when you put a kind of a low trust organization, organizations where they say, we're not going to trust the people at level one to make the right decisions. You have to move all, all of your decisions up the chain as far as possible. Um, you know, we have this issue of this illusion of control. And, uh, you know, this is kind of a fun exercise to look at your, at your company's uh, ticket system, all your approvals, right? And say, out of the total number of approvals we have in the organization, subtract the number of approvals that were information radiators, right? That were just people need to know, right? I make sure that I'm going to do something and everybody wants to be copied on it because we had problems in the past. So that's been a new, you know, new thing we, we need to add. Also subtract out all the, all the CYAs, right? You know, all the just, I, I'm, I'm doing this approval to, to check the boxes to, to, to prove that I have followed the process. And subtract out all the, all the, the approvals where the person, the, the approvals being, being, uh, you're seeking approval from um, is too far removed to judge whether or not that was actually safe or, or appropriate. And this is re very much a tricky one because people don't like to admit as they go higher in the ranks that they really don't have the context to make these calls, right? For example, think about our, our story. Those VPs were you know, five or six levels away from touching the keyboard, yet they were the ones making the decision in the middle of the day whether or not it was safe to do a customer, a customer restart. They didn't have any of the on the ground context. At that point, they're effectively guessing Yet we rely on, we rely on that sort of you know, highest paid person in the chain to make the uh, decision. And then with what you've got left, you know, how many are you left with, right? Uh, how many were the right call, right? How that, that's something people often follow up on is, is you know, how many times we make an approval and then it turns out to be not what we, what we thought. And how many got rejected overall, right? It's probably a shockingly low number. For example, we ran this exercise with an um, insurance company a number of years ago. And overall, from the senior manager level up, I think there's less than 100 people in the organization. 
And in the first six months of the year, they had 25,000 approvals sent through their, their organization, right? Each of those spanning multiple uh, emails, right? Some people had where they would just shuffle them all off into another, another folder and just wait till somebody bugged them. Some people would actually auto-reply, yes, <laughs> to, uh, to, uh, to everything. And the reality was less than 1% of those um, ever got rejected, right? It was all this information radiators, you know, cover your ass type, type stuff happening. And of that one, per and of the amount that they approved, well, I guess obviously it makes sense that of all those approvals, they approved everything and they had all kinds of operational issues. So another thing to think about when it comes to, to tickets and uh, in reality is are these approvals actually worth anything? Um, so, you know, if we want to see a healthy organization, a high trust organization, uh, we want the ability to push uh, decision making closest to the point uh, of, of the transaction, either who has the idea or has the you know the interaction with the customer, or closest to the uh, to the incident. Um, there's a great story out there in the kind of DevOps world of um, Ticketmaster. You know they had uh, just by employing this this th this idea and saying how can we empower the people in the knock, empower the people in the level one to take action. They took their average MTTR for major web facing incidents from like 40 minutes down to like four minutes. Right? Because they realized a large percentage of the problems happen over and over again. You know, complex, distributed, global organization, keep running into the same problems. They focused on how do we empower the knock with the right tooling, with the right information, get out of this idea that we have to escalate everything up the chain because it wasn't actually making things, things, uh, things better. And you know, I said, well, OK, well, that's great. But you know, the, the real reason why we have this low trust is because of security and compliance. And uh, we've seen plenty of organizations who are in, you know, uh, kind of high compliance, high security environments. Uh, to them, they build in security into, the, into this model, right? To them, the, the operations as a service layer, um, where they're telling everyone to create these operational services that, that people in the organization can use, that's where they enforce security, that's where they enforce compliance. And they find out it's actually more secure and has a better audit trail than the old-fashioned method, which is use the ticket system to route things to all these siloed, siloed uh, labor pools. So uh, a bit of a recap here. Uh, I know I covered a lot. These slides, uh, will all be, um, I'll put them on Twitter, and then also I think they're distributing them in, in the, uh, the, um, the conference here. Number one, don't forget about ops, right? Uh, you know, we, we, we celebrate delivery. Uh, we, you know, we, we get excited about making new things. Um, people get bonuses because they delivered this great new project. But we, gotta forget, we can't forget about where most of our labor, most of our time, most of our pain really comes from is, is, uh, is operations. Understand the cost of, of queues, right? We got to get real on you know, what it actually costs to, uh, to use the ticket-driven request queues as the way to run, to run our lives, and uh, that it may not have been the right, the right decision from the beginning. Uh, understand the perils of these ticket-driven request queues. I think I just, uh, just said that. Uh, focus on removing the silos and, and the queues, right? Think about organizationally, team-wise, how can we change the flow of work and change our team around that flow of work to limit those, those handoffs? Um, you know, look to things like the operations as a service, you know, design pattern to try to, um, you know, uh, um, handle those or improve those handoffs uh, where we can't, uh, you know, get rid of them uh, through this kind of, you know, re reorganization. And then uh, lastly, um, you know, focus on shifting left the control and, and the decision making in our organization so we can have the right people with the right context empowered to take, to take action and solve problems early and, uh, and, uh, and decisively, unlike that crazy story, that we, the true story, <laughs> that we saw that should have been a simple task if we would empower the people at the point of contact with the right tools um, and the right information to get it, to get it done. Instead, we had this whole, whole you know, day-long outage. And the reality is, uh, you know, they had five or six of those things going on at once, right? So it wasn't just one, one, uh, one problem. So... Um, I'm Damon Edwards. Uh, you can always email me, damon at rundeck.com. Uh, you can find me on Twitter, at Damon Edwards. Uh, if you want to learn more about that operations and service design pattern, there's like an ebook um, and stuff that we have on our, on our, on our, uh, on our site, uh, rundeck.com slash OAAS, because we need, we need another AAS right, in, our, in, our, in our lives. And um, that's my talk. Uh, I'll be around uh, for a bit if you uh, guys want to... Uh, want to chat, I encourage you to go back to your organizations and really question how do we do operations and uh, how can we make it better. Thank you. All right, thanks a lot, Damon. Uh, Good presentation, enjoyed it a lot.
Next, we have uh, Alex Ellis coming up uh, from VMware. He'll be up here shortly, um, so please stick around. Thank you.